This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Plague Ship by Andre Norton. Chapter 12 Strange Behavior of a Hubat. All right, so we think we know a little more. Ollie added a moment later. Just what are we going to do? We can't stay in space forever. They're the small items of fuel and supplies, and... Rip had come to a decision. We're not going to remain space-born, he stated with the confidence of one who now saw an open road before him. Luna? Weeks was plainly doubtful. No, not after that worn-off. Terra. For a second or two, the other three stared at Rip agape. The audacity and danger of what he suggested was a little stunning. Since men had taken regularly to space, no ship had made a direct landing on their home planet. All had passed through the quarantine on Luna. It was not only risky, it was so unheard of that for some minutes they did not understand him. We try to set down at Terraport. Dane found his tongue first, and they flame us out. Rip was smiling. The trouble with you, he addressed them all, is that you think of Earth only in terms of Terraport. Well, there is the patrol field at Stella, Weeks agreed doubtfully, but we'd be right in the middle of trouble there. Did we have a regular port on Sargal, on Limbo? On fifty others I can name out of our log? Rip wanted to know. Ollie voiced a new objection. So, we have the luck of Jones and we set down somewhere out of sight. Then what do we do? We seal the ship until we find the pest. Then we bring in a medic and get to the bottom of the whole thing. Rip's confidence was contagious. Dane almost believed that it could be done that way. Did you ever think, Ollie cut in, what would happen if we were wrong, if the Queen really is a plague carrier? I said we seal the ship, tight, countered Shannon, and when we earth it'll be where we won't have visitors to infect. And that is where, Ollie, who knew the deserts of Mars better than he did the greener planet from which his stock had sprung, pursued the question. Right in the middle of the big burn. Dane, Terra born and bred, realized first what Rip was planning and what it meant. Sealed off was right. The Queen would be amply protected from investigation. Whether her crew would survive was another matter. Whether she could even make a landing there was also to be considered. The big burn was the horrible scar left by the last of the atomic wars a section of radiation-poison land comprising hundreds of square miles, land which generations had never dared to penetrate. Originally, the survivors of that war had shunned the whole continent which it disfigured. It had been close to two centuries before men had gone into the still wholesome land laying to the far west and the south. And through the years, the avoidance of the big burn had become part of their racial instinct as they shrank from it. It was a symbol of something no Terran wanted to remember. But Ollie now had only one question to ask. Can we do it? We'll never know until we try, was Rip's reply. The patrol will be watching. That was Weeks. With his Venusian background, he had less respect for the dangers of the Big Burn than he did for the forces of law and order which ranged the star lanes. "'They'll be watching the route lanes,' Rip pointed out. "'They won't expect a ship to come in on that vector, steering away from the ports. Why should they? As far as I know, it's never been tried since Terraport was laid out. It'll be tricky.' and he himself would have to bear most of the responsibility for it. 
but I believe that it can be done. We can't just roam around out here. With I.S. out for our blood and a patrol worn off, it won't do us any good to head for Luna." None of his listeners could argue with that. And Dane's spirits began to rise. After all, they knew so little about the Big Burn. It might afford them just the temporary sanctuary they needed. In the end, they agreed to try it, mainly because none of them could see any alternative, except the too dangerous one of trying to contact the authorities and being summarily treated as a plague ship before they could defend themselves. And their decision was ably endorsed not long afterwards by a sardonic warning on the comm, a warning which Ali, who had been tending the machine, passed along to them. "'Greetings, pirates!' "'What do you mean?' Dane was heating broth to feed to Captain Jellicoe. The word has gone out. Our raid on the Eastad is now a matter of history and patrol record. We've been posted. Dane felt a cold finger drawn along his backbone. Now they were fair game for the whole system. Any patrol ship that wanted could shoot them down with no questions asked. Of course, that had always been a possibility from the first after their raid on the Eastat. But to realize that it was now true was a different matter altogether. This was one occasion when realization was worse than anticipation. He tried to keep his voice level as he answered. Let's hope we can pull off Rip's plan. We'd better. What about the big burn anyway, Thorson? Is it as tough as the stories say? We don't know what it's like. It's never been explored, or at least those who tried to explore its interior never reported in afterwards. As far as I know, it's left strictly alone. Is it still all hot? Parts of it must be. But all we don't know. With the bottle of soup in his hand, Dane climbed to Jellicoe's cabin and he was so occupied with the problem at hand that at first he did not see what was happening in the small room. He had braced the captain up into a half-sitting position, and was patiently ladling the liquid into his mouth a spoonful at a time, when a thin squeak drew his attention to the top of Jellicoe's desk. From the half-open lid of a microtape compartment something long and dark projected, beating the air feebly. Dane easing the captain back on the bunk, was going to investigate, when the hubat broke its unnatural quiet of the past few days with an ear-splitting screech of fury. Dane struck at the bottom of its cage, the move its master always used to silence it, but this time the results were spectacular. The cage bounced up and down on the spring which secured it to the ceiling of the cabin, and the blue-feathered horror slammed against the wires. Either its clawing had weakened them, or some fault had developed, for they parted and the hubat came through them to land with a sullen plop on the desk. Its scream stopped as suddenly as they had begun, and it scuttled on its spider-toed legs to the microtape compartment, acting with purposeful dispatch and paying no attention to Dane. Its claws shot out, and with ease it extracted from the compartment a creature as weird as itself, one which came fighting and of which Dane could not get a very clear idea. Struggling, they battled across the surface of the desk and flopped to the floor. There the hunted broke loose from the hunter and fled with fantastic speed into the corridor. And before Dane could move, the hubat was after it. He gained the passage just in time to see Queeks disappear down the ladder, clinging with the aid of its pincher claws, apparently grimly determined to catch up with the thing it pursued. And Dane went after them. There was no sign of the creature who fled on the next level. But Dane made no move to recapture the blue hunter who squatted at the foot of the ladder, staring unblinkingly into space. Dane waited, afraid to disturb the hubat. He had not had a good look at the thing which had run from Queeks, but he knew it was something which had no business aboard the Queen. And it might be the disturbing factor they were searching for. 
if the Hubat would only lead him to it. The Hubat moved, rearing up on the tips of its six legs, its neckless head slowly revolving on its puffy shoulders. Along the ridge of its backbone its blue feathers were rising into a crest, much as Sinbad's fur rose when the cat was afraid or angry. Then, without any sign of haste, it crawled over and began descending the ladder once more, heading toward the lower section which housed the hydro. Dane remained where he was until it had almost reached the deck of the next level, and then he followed, one step at a time. He was sure that the Hubat's peculiar construction of body prevented it from looking up, unless it turned upon its back, but he did not want to do anything which would alarm it, or deter Queeks from what he was sure was a methodical chase. Queeks stopped again at the foot of the second descent, and sat in its toad stance, apparently brooding a round blue blot. Dane clung to the ladder and prayed that no one would happen along to frighten it. Then, just as he was beginning to wonder if it had lost contact with its prey, once more it arose, and with the same speed it had displayed in the captain's cabin it shot along the corridor to the hydro. To Dane's knowledge, the door of the garden was not only shut, but sealed, and how either the stranger or Queeks could get through it he did not see. "'What the?' Ollie clattered down the ladder to halt abruptly as Dane waved at him. "'Queeks!' the cargo apprentice kept his voice to a half-whisper. "'It got loose and chased something out of the old man's cabin down here.' "'Queeks!' Ollie began, then shut his mouth, moving noiselessly up to join Dane. The short corridor ended at the hydro entrance. And Dane had been right. There they found the Hubat, crouched at the closed panel, its claws clicking against the metal as it picked away useless at the portal which would not admit it. "'Whatever it's after must be in there,' Dane said softly. And the hydro, stripped of its luxuriance of plant life, occupied now by the tanks of green scum, would not afford too many hiding places. They had only to let Queeks in and keep watch. As they came up, the Hubat flattened to the floor and shrilled its war cry, spitting at their boots and then flashing claws against the stout, metal enforced hide. However, though it was prepared to fight them, it showed no signs of wishing to retreat, and for that Dane was thankful. He quickly pressed the release and tugged open the panel. At the first crack of its opening, Queeks turned with one of those bursts of astounding speed and clawed for admittance, its protest against the men forgotten. And it squeezed through a space Dane would have thought too narrow to accommodate its bloated body. Both men slipped around the door behind it and closed the panel tight. The air was not as fresh as it had been when the plants were there, and the vats which had taken the places of the banked greenery were certainly nothing to look at. Queeks humped itself into a clod of blue, immovable, halfway down the aisle. Dane tried to subdue his breathing to listen. The Hubat's action certainly argued that the alien thing had taken refuge here, though how it had gotten through. But if it were in the hydro, it was well hidden. He had just begun to wonder how long they must wait when Queeks again went into action. Its clawed front legs upraised, it brought the pinchers deliberately together and sawed one across the other, producing a rasping sound which was almost a vibration in the air. Back and forth, back and forth moved the claws. Watching them produced almost a hypnotic effect, and the reason for such a maneuver was totally beyond the human watchers. But Queeks knew what it was doing all right. Ollie's fingers closed on Dane's arm, in a pincher grip as painful as if he had been equipped with the horny armament of the Hubat. Something, a flitting shadow, had rounded one vat and was that much closer to the industrious fiddler on the floor. By some weird magic of its own, the Hubat was calling its prey to it. Scrape, scrape, 
the unmusical performance continued with monotonous regularity. Again the shadow flashed, one vat closer. The hoobat now presented the appearance of one charmed by its own art, sunk in a lethargy of weird music-making. At last the enchanted came into full view, though lingering at the round side of a container, very apparently longing to flee again, but under some compulsion to approach its enchanter. Dane blinked, not quite sure that his eyes were not playing tricks on him. He had seen the almost transparent globe bogies of Limbo, had been fascinated by the weird and ugly pictures in Captain Jellicoe's collection of Tri-D prints. But this creature was as impossible in its way as the horrific blue thing dragging it out of concealment. It walked erect on two threads of legs, with four knobby joints easily detected. A bulging abdomen sheathed in the horny substance of a beetle shell ended in a sharp point. Two pairs of small legs, folded close to the much smaller upper portion of its body, were equipped with thorn-shack terminations. The head, which constantly turned back and forth on the armor-plated shoulders, was long and narrow, and split for half its length by a mouth above which were deep pits which must harbor eyes, though actual organs were not visible to the watching men. It was a palish gray in color, which surprised Dane a little. His memory of the few seconds he had seen it on the captain's desk had suggested that it was much darker. And erect as it was, it stood about eighteen inches high. With head turning rapidly, it still hesitated by the side of the vat, so nearly the color of the metal that unless it moved it was difficult to distinguish. As far as Dane could see, the hubat was paying it no attention. Queeks might be lost in a happy dream, the result of its own fiddling. Nor did the rhythm of that scraping vary. The nightmare thing made the last foot in a rush of speed which reduced it to a blur, coming to a halt before the hubat. Its front legs whipped out to strike at its enemy. But Queeks was no longer dreaming. This was the moment the hubat had been awaiting. One of the sawing claws opened and closed, separating the head of the lurker from its body. And before either of the men could interfere, Queeks had dismembered the prey with dispatch. Look there, Dane pointed. The hubat held close the body of the stranger, and where the ashy corpse came into contact with Queeks's blue feathered skin, it was slowly changing hue, as if some of the color of its hunter had rubbed off on it. Chameleon! Ollie went down on one knee, the better to view the grisly feast now in progress. Watch out, he added sharply as Dane came to join him. One of the thin upper limbs lay where Queeks had discarded it, and from the needle tip was oozing some colorless drops of fluid. Poison? Dane looked around for something which he could use to pick up the still jerking appendage, but before he could find anything, Queeks had appropriated it, and in the end they had to allow the hubat its victim in its entirety. But once Queeks had consumed its prey, it lapsed into its usual hunched immobility. Dane went for the cage, and working gingerly, he and Ollie got the creature back in captivity. But all the evidence now left were some smears on the floor of the hydro, smears which Ollie blotted up for future research in the lab. An hour later, the four who now comprised the crew of the Queen gathered in the mess for a conference. Queeks was in its cage on the table before them, asleep after all its untoward activity. "'There must be more than just one,' Weeks said. "'But how are we going to hunt them down? With Sinbad?' Dane shook his head. Once the Hubat had been caged and the more prominent evidence of the battle scraped from the floor, he had brought the cat into the hydro and forced him to sniff at the sight of the engagement. The result was that Sinbad had gone raving mad, and Dane's hands were now covered with claw tears which ran viciously deep. It was plain that the ship's cat was having none of the intruders, alive or dead. He had fled to Dane's cabin, where he had taken refuge on the bunk and snarled wild-eyed when anyone looked in from the corridor. 
Queeks has to do it, Rip said. But will it hunt unless it's hungry? He surveyed the now comatose creature skeptically. They had never seen the captain's pet eat anything except some pellets which Jellicoe kept in his desk, and they were afraid that the intervals between such feedings were quite lengthy. If they had to wait the usual time for Queeks to feel hunger pangs once more, they might have to wait a long time. "'We should catch one alive,' Ollie remarked thoughtfully. "'If we could get Queeks to fiddle it out where we could net it—' Weeks nodded eagerly. "'A small net, like those the Salariki use. Drop it over the thing.' While Queeks still drowsed in its cage, Weeks went to work with fine cord. Holding the color-changing abilities of the enemy in mind, they could not tell how many of the creatures might be roaming the ship. It could only be proved where they weren't by where Sinbad would consent to stay. So they made plans which included both the cat and the hubat. Sinbad, much against his will, was buckled into an improvised harness by which he could be controlled without the handler losing too much valuable skin. And then the hunt started at the top of the ship, proceeding downward section by section. Sinbad raised no protest in the control cabin, nor in the private cabins of the officers thereabouts. If they could interpret his reactions, the center section was free of the invaders. So, with Dane in control of the cat, and Ollie carrying the caged hubat, they descended once more to the level which housed the hydro galley, steward's quarters, and ship's sick bay. Sinbad proceeded on his own four feet into the galley and the mess. He was not uneasy in the sick bay, nor in Mura's cabin, and this time he even paced the hydro without being dragged, much to their surprise as they had thought that the headquarters of the stowaways. Could there only have been one? Weeks wanted to know as he stood by ready with the net in his hands. Either that, or else we're wrong about the hydro being their main hideout. If they're afraid of Queeks now, they may have withdrawn to the place they feel the safest, Rip said. It was when they were on the ladder leading to the cargo level that Sinbad balked. He planted himself firmly and yowled against further progress, until Dane, with the harness, pulled him along. Look at Queeks. They followed Weeks' order. The hubat was no longer lethargic. It was raising itself, leaning forward to clasp the bars of its cage, and now it uttered one of its screams of rage. And as Ollie went down the ladder, it rattled the bars in a determined effort for freedom. Sinbad, spitting and yowling, refused to walk. Rip nodded to Ollie. Let it out. Tipped out of its cage, the hubat scuttled forward, straight for the panel which opened on the large cargo space, and there waited, as if for them to open the portal and admit the hunter to its hunting territory. End of chapter 12